just want to let me say a couple of things. You know, I'm thankful for pastor's study on John 15. And I think this is where um, I got this lesson because as he was uh, going through John 15, I was reading through the life of Saul. And uh, it's interesting how, how the Bible, specifically in the Old Testament, gives you kind of a big picture view of someone's life and that person's life and, and their choices kind of develop. And uh, it kind of gives you a, 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 it shows you what faith in God looks like when we put our trust in God and we follow that through and what uh, disobedience to God and how that plays out in a person's life. And I think Saul is a perfect example of of the opposite. And I was as I was uh, praying about what the Lord wanted me to um, speak about, uh, it really, you know, it's it's always it's always I'm think uh, I think it's always in reference to what I'm reading through. And I was actually going through the book of First Samuel as Pastor was speaking about uh, John 15, specifically the, those first few chapters. And uh, he didn't really touch on the 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 chap the, the verse that I'm going to be speaking in reference to, but uh, it's part of it. So let me just read John uh, <clears throat> John 15 and uh, maybe the first eight verses. And uh, just to recap, and then we're going to go to the Old Testament. I just want to kind of uh, read through it. It says, uh, John 15, it says, I am the true vine, and my father the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit, it of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that, that abideth in me, as I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now, this is the verse that I got this message from specifically. This is what the Lord was kind of bringing me to. And verse 6 says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And, and, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, this is seven, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And then we're going to finish with eight. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciple. And he continues on uh, this instruction for the disciples. This is the last time he speaks uh, to his disciples uh, before he's taken to the cross the next uh, chapter as well. And then 17 is the prayer, the high priestly prayer of Jesus to the Father for us, not just the disciples, but everyone who would believe uh, in, uh, after uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. So, but like I said, I'm very thankful for the, that study because really it's the key uh, to un understanding that and, and applying these truths to, to our life is essential to a fruitful walk with God. And like I said, verse six warns us of the danger of not abiding in Jesus. Uh, this is clearly illustrated for us in the life of King Saul. And uh, we'll, we'll go to uh, 1 Samuel 10 after we pray. Again, Father, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for the instruction and, and the, the warnings that you give us through your word. They're, they're clearly the, uh, left for us to study and to read and to be admonished and to be warned. Lord, thank you again for our Lord Jesus, who's the one that uh, uh, wrote the word. He is the word of God. And thank you again for the instruction and the and the, uh, the understanding that your Holy Spirit gives. Father, I do pray for this time together as we uh, sit around your word, as we look to you. Lord, we don't want to hear from a man. We want to hear from you. Holy Spirit of God, we do commit this time to you. We pray that you would magnify Jesus, that he would be lifted up. And your word promises that if he's lifted up, that you will draw men unto yourself. And so, Father, we do pray for that. We ask that uh, you would speak to every heart here. You know every need. You know every person here. Uh, you know the dilemmas and the trials and the and the issues that we're uh, going through. You know what it is, Lord, that we need to hear. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak. Speak through your servant. Hide me in the shadow of your wing. And may Jesus be magnified, in whose name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, 1 Samuel 10. So I'm just going to read as well a few a few verses. Just say, uh, uh, this is where uh, Saul is anointed as king. And here in chapter 10, 
And you know, uh, you know about uh, Saul. He loses his uh, animals. He's still not in uh, North. He's still a young man. He loses his uh, I think his, his donkeys, and uh, and then he goes after them. And but God is already speaking to Samuel, telling him that 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 Saul is coming, and you're going to anoint him king. And so uh, you know, while all this is going on, uh, here in chapter ten is where he's actually meets Samuel, and Samuel anoints him and tells him what's going to happen to him. And so let's just read a few verses here, chapter 10. It says, uh, uh, verse 1, it says, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, it, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And then he explains to him what's going to happen to him right after he leaves. So he prophesies that this is going to happen to you. You're going to go to the uh, uh, area where there's Philistine, the garrison, and then there's going to be people there and they're going to prophesy and then you're going to prophesy and then you're going to receive uh the holy spirit and then you're going to have to receive a new heart he tells them all these things in verse six says and the spirit of the lord uh will come upon thee uh, this is samuel talking and thou shalt prophesy with them he's speaking about these men that he's going to meet on the way and shall be turned into another man and so this is uh um samuel speaking to Saul about what's going to happen to him. And it's interesting that that he tells him that that uh, he's going to prophesy. The only way to prophesy is to receive the spirit, right? And then he says he's going to be turned into a new man. And in verse 9, he says, and it was so that when he had turned back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. It, it reminds me, I think, in, in Deuteronomy 30, uh, God promises uh, through Moses that he's going to give the children of Israel a new heart. I think this is the closest that we're, we uh, we can get to uh, in an Old Testament sense of salvation, of of, of uh, this man uh, having a relationship with God, at least being an initial connection with God in a sense where it has transformed his heart. So, and my point in that is that this man is uh, being equipped by God to be a king, to be the king of Israel. And so God is... is uh, he doesn't want him to fail. He wants him to completely succeed, and he's giving him everything that he needs uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, to be a good king, to be a good leader. And so, King Saul's life reveals the importance of obedience in the life of a believer. Uh, how disobedience moves us far from the God-given resources that are ours because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Uh, uh, I just read it the other day in one of the Psalms. It says that he led captivity captive, speaking of the Messiah in the future. And, and when he did that, he brought, gave gifts unto men. Those gifts are what we're going to be talking about. We're just going to talk about three specific things that we receive uh, as believers that Saul actually received to be able to be a successful leader. I'm thankful that specifically in the Old Testament, we get this idea of us a battle, right? It's always David battling the Philistines or the Amalekites, and it's always uh, Joshua coming into the land and gaining ground. It's always a scene. It's an actual physical battle for us, for them. But for us, we have to understand that we're also in a battle. It's a spiritual battle, but that spiritual battle has effects to, to the world that we live in today. And I think a lot of us are kind of asleep to that. And so because of that, Satan gains ground. Uh, Jesus says that uh, he says that the, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Well, the violent one is Satan. He's he's the uh, the the Bible says that he was a murderer from the beginning. And if we don't understand that we are in a spiritual battle and we have resources that God has given us that we c we can uh, depend on, we can use, uh, then we're going to we're going to be defeated. We're going to be lost. And I think uh, Saul is is a is a good um, example of a man who had these resources. He had everything that he needed to conquer the enemy, uh, to become a great king, to lead Israel, to conquer the Philistines, and yet he was a complete failure. You see him there at the end of his life, uh, going to a, a witch, to a, to a soothsayer, and uh, asking to see to see uh, Samuel, whom he hadn't seen in years. And uh, and just in his own strength, in his own power, trying to get some wisdom, some 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 uh, some knowledge, and not going to God. The Bible says that God departed from him. That's that's a really really sad 
uh, statement there in the Bible. But uh, let's continue on. I'm getting ahead of myself. You say, so uh, as I said, um, when I, I just read it, it says, Saul receives a new heart. So he's given that heart for God. That's not something that he was missing. It's not something that he didn't have. God gave him that desire for God. I do believe that that, that was something that he wanted to do. He wanted to bat, do the battle uh, with the enemy and defeat the enemy for the Lord. But some somewhere down the line, he uh, he lost that sense of, of direction, that guidance that the Lord, uh, that the Lord was the focus and not just the battle in itself. And so we see that in 1 Samuel 10, 9, it says, it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, I just read it, God gave him another heart. And so God gives him another heart. So it's a desire to do the work of the Lord, to, to follow after God. And so, but not only that, he also receives the Holy Spirit. In 1 Samuel 10, 6, uh, it says, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and thou shalt prophesy with them and shall be turned into another man. So the Holy Spirit comes upon him because he needed the spirit of God to do the work of God. Uh, it's something that that we have to understand, even as believers, when going back to John 15, right? He says, he's the vine, we're the branches. And apart from him, we can do nothing. It's his spirit in filling us and empowering us to live the life that pleases God, that brings God glory. And so it's that's the, uh, the, 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 the plan for God, uh, of God for us, that the Holy Spirit empowers us to live the life that pleases God. That's the only way to do it. We can't please God any other way. We can't do it in our own strength, in our own ability. And so it's only through the Spirit of God, because it's only through Christ, really. It's the Spirit of Christ that does it. And so we see that he receives the Holy Spirit because he desperately needs the Holy Spirit to be able to fight the battles of the Lord. So do we. We need the spirit of God to be able to fight this battle. Uh, the Bible says that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not fighting each other. We're not even fighting uh, unbelievers. We're fighting these principalities, these powers, these stones and dominions that are influencing these people that sometimes we get angry with, we get upset with. But that's Satan seeking to get us, you know, um, looking at the wrong thing. And so really our battle really is on our knees because we we can't even see these principalities we can't even see these powers so only god who's already defeated them through christ only christ himself who's seated at the right hand of the father who's seated above all these principalities can defeat them and can tear down whatever strongholds they're 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 uh, they're, they're seeking to build in our lives in the life of of uh, family members in the life of a city in the life of a nation. And so that's the only way is through prayer, really. And so we see that Saul receives the Holy Spirit. But not only that, in 1 Samuel 10, 26, and let me just read it, he receives something else. In 26, it says, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. He also received a band of men. He received a group of people that would help him to be able to fight the battles of God. He wasn't gonna do it by himself. He couldn't do it by himself. And so God here is equipping this man to be able to fight the battles of the Lord. It's the same thing with us. We are equipped with that. We're, we're placed in a body, we're placed in the church. We're not just supposed to be doing these things on our own by ourselves. The first thing that happened at, in the garden when uh, Adam and Eve sinned is he brought division. That sin brought division between Adam and Eve. And God's been seeking to bring the family back together again. And that family, when he starts with Abraham, he's building a family. When he's, he, he, uh, he blesses David, he's using his family to bring forth the Messiah. When he uh, builds his church, right, there in Acts 2, the first thing is uh, the believers are baptized. And the Bible says that they're added into, um, in, into, the, into the church, in the, into the ecclesia, into the, uh, the called out ones, into the those that are called out to the church itself. And so that's what God does. Just like he equipped uh, Saul with a, with a group of people to help them fight the battles of the Lord, so are we. We're equipped with the body of believers. We're put into his Jesus Christ body to be able to do the work of the ministry, to be able to be uh, to edify. I think 1 Corinthians 12 talks about that, how there's all these different gifts. I mean, it, it's 
it's a I've never I really uh, sadly I've never seen that at least in the Western Church, but it's a beautiful picture there in First Corinthians twelve where there is so many people just with these gifts spiritual gifts where there there's a teacher there's a, a there's someone that that is a preaching and there's someone that's praying and there's someone that everyone has a spiritual gifts and they're working together as one body building up the church and edifying everyone else and so there's no lack because everyone has something to to give towards the body and uh and and so that's the equipment i i think of uh just reading through like i said i'm going through samuel and one of the things that uh that uh, the bible takes time is to to uh, to to show you uh david's mighty men and it, it tells you about their feet and this man is did this and he killed a lion in a, in a thing by himself with his bare hands and this guy killed a hundred men with you know with an axe gold or something like that and it just shows you all these mighty men that david had and david was equipped with these men him too the bible says that there's people that god uh impacts and touches so that they follow david in fact, there's a beautiful um, uh, verse there in uh, in the Bible where um, where these men come to him. I forgot. I can't tell you specifically. But these men come to him, and he's like, he, David confronts him, said, "Why are you here?" And and the men, one of them prophesies, and he says, "Thine are we, David." And it's an incredible. It's a beautiful picture of these men who God has touched to give themselves to David because they knew that he is following God. And so that's that's a the beautiful picture. So we we see that Saul was given everything that he needed to be able to to fight the battles of the Lord and and win. And so we see, but Saul also had uh, Samuel, and I think Samuel represents the Word of God. Samuel, it was uh, the Word of God to to Saul. And so whenever, and I think it's one of the reasons why eventually uh, he was separated from Saul after Saul. I was disobedient and so the question is how can someone who has so much provision and potential fail because really sadly Saul's life is is a failure and God begins to use him not uh positively but negatively he still uses him but he uses him in the life of David to make David a, a good leader it's, a, it's an interesting uh contrast uh that we see as, as Saul becomes further as he moves further and further from God he God uses Saul to move David closer and closer to the Lord it's an incredible picture when you start seeing these things how God is working and using even uh Saul for his glory <clears throat> and so we see that but really there's only one word and and we see that in Saul's life it's disobedience and so you have this all, all this uh resources available to you and yet the only thing that 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 was a failure was that this man uh was disobedient to god and i think part of it is and i think uh, uh, the, the reason for the title of this message trust and obey was uh i don't know when it happened i think at the beginning he did trust god but for you to obey someone you have to be able to trust them and i think and it also happens to us and oh, i know it's happened to me that if I'm not drawing close to God and I'm not seeking God, if I'm not in God's word, then eventually Satan uses that in my life for me not to trust God. And so if I can't trust him, then I can't obey him. And somewhere down the line, Saul uh, got to that point where he couldn't trust God and he refused to obey him. And so, so but but that's, that's it. Whatever happened, I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened, but that may have been what happened. Because we can't trust someone that we uh, we can't obey someone that we don't trust, and so uh, so here in Samuel, let's go to First Samuel thirteen, and this is the first time he uh, he he um, the first time he he basically sins, and First uh, Samuel thirteen, yeah, thirteen three. I'm sorry, just get to that. Let me just start from there. And Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years, think about it. He just began his reign. This is a year, within a year of his his uh, his enthronement, within a year of his anointing, 
he's reigning one year. And uh, he says, uh, when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in, in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with jo Jonathan and Gibeah and Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. So he has a specific group of people, and then he feels he doesn't need the rest of them, so he sends them to their tent. Okay? Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard, saying that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that, that was it was actually Jonathan, but you know, Saul is John, Saul's son. And that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. So the Philistines were upset. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. So this is the, the picture. Okay. And then what happens is uh, the Philistines are gathering together and all these things are happening. And it seems like the people are, are wait, they're waiting for Samuel, right? He's waiting for the word of God to, for God to direct them on what to do. And uh, I guess Saul sees that the people are kind of antsy and it seems like they're about to, to, uh, to disband. So he decides that he's going to sacrifice, uh, do a sacrifice for the Lord, and then he's going to do the, the, this thing. And I think what happens is it's not necessarily the sacrifice, but he wasn't willing to wait for, for Samuel and to hear what God had to say about the battle. One of the things uh, that's different between Saul and uh, David is that you really see David inquiring of the Lord. So like every time he goes to battle, right before he goes to a battle, he goes, uh, David inquired of the Lord and God provided him. I think it was Abiathar, or one of the priests that was, that's another interesting story that one of the priests that was, um, that was in a specific town that Saul ultimately wound up killing all of the priests. And this priest was able to escape and ran to David and he became David's seer, David's prophet really. And he would uh, tell David and whenever David wanted to hear from the Lord, he had this man that was with him running away from Saul that would inquire the Lord for him. So it, that, that's also a beautiful picture of God, you know, going with David. And so we see that that picture that that this man is not willing to wait for the word of the Lord like David. David always inquired of the Lord before he went to battle. And so what happens if 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 he's leading the armies of the Lord? And he's not willing to listen, wait and, and, and listen to the Lord, then God can't use him. It's impossible for God to do what he needs to do on, unless the person that he has assigned to be his 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 ambassador, his his worker, is uh is is gonna do what he tells him to do. It's a it's a, it's a bad situation. It's like God telling Moses that he's gonna bring him into Egypt, but then when Moses gets there, he does something completely different or uh, he just doesn't go at all. You have to do what the Lord uh, calls uh, you to do or else, you know, you're not going to, or like uh, Joshua, right? Joshua, you know, the Lord gives him these instructions about going around the city. And uh, he's like, well, you know, it's kind of like, that's too much. I'll just go around the city one time and then maybe I'll do it the, the, the that seventh day and then I'll I'll do it however I want. It, it can't be happened. God would have removed uh, Joshua and would have picked someone else someone that will listen to him but we do i i do that all the time i feel the holy spirit directing me and guiding me to do that and i decide well you know let's just you know I'm, I'll, I'll do it I'm, i'll do it when i want to or when i get a chance to it that's not what god desires and that's why we wind up really being defeated by the enemy the enemy is the only one that wins when when we do things like that god calls us to to do these things when when he calls us to do them and obedience is really the key and so here we see the first time where he uh disobeys god or at least he doesn't seek god's counsel uh for direction to how to fight the philistines because he's desperate you know he he sees the things that are going on in the situation and he does make excuses but at you know at the end of the day it's disobedience and then we we, we see the the second the second one here uh then the second one is he does obey, but it's partial obedience. Again, we do that all the time. I do that all the time as well. You know, the Holy Spirit asks me to do something and I, I do it, but I do it, you know, when it's convenient for me or or if it if it coincides with my schedule or, if, 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 you know, if I can fit it into my whatever, then I'll do it. And that's that's also disobedience. And uh, we see it in the life of Saul and, and we say, yeah, you know, 
he disobeyed God, but we do the same thing. And so here we see that as, as God is calling him to, he wants him to be a leader. He wants him to be a successful leader, but he can't be a successful leader because he can't see what's going to happen. He can't see the battle. Uh, it's like Gideon, right? Gideon was told how to defeat these enemies. And if he had done it any other way, it wouldn't work because God knows what's going to happen. God is the one that sees the future. If we can't, I mean, I, I know I do this myself. We can't reinvent the wheel. God has set a specific way for a Christian to, to be saved, to be developed, and to grow. If we try to do it on our own, our own way, or try to reimagine it, however we think that we are, I know that's the American way. We have to redo everything. We have to reimagine everything. You know, we, we reinvent the wheel every every couple of every couple of years, but that's not the way that God works. God desires obedience. That's how it works. He knows the future. He knows what's coming. If we think we know better than God, then we're foolish, and really, He can't use us. And so that's that's uh, this is uh, Saul's uh, problem. And so what happens? So he showed he chose partial obedience. We know that God tells him to to fight. Um, who was the Amalekites, and uh, and uh, he's supposed to ki kill King Agag, and they do kill a lot of people, mostly the men, but they uh, they save some of the cattle and they don't kill the king himself. So actually, Samuel has the one is the one that has to actually do it, and so you see that he, and it really it was convenience because he's probably saw all the cattle and he was like, well, you know, it's like it's kind of a waste. Why kill it all? You know. It really it reminds me of what happened uh, with uh, Achan, right, in uh, <clears throat> in uh, Joshua, and how many lives were lost because this man decided to keep this uh, Babylonian garment, right? Because it was probably a beautiful garment. It probably had a lot of gold. It probably looked really good. It probably could have you know been used by him, or he could have melted it down. Whatever excuse he used to use it, but that's the thing. It was it was disobedience. He didn't completely do what God wanted him to do. And you know what happens, you know, uh, in the book of Esther, right? Uh, the, the person that uh, that ultimately is the one that's seeking to kill the Jews was an Agagite, right? And so God knew the future. God knew what was coming. All that could have been avoided if uh, if um, <clears throat> if uh, Saul would have done what he was told to do. Going back to looking to God and doing what God calls us to do. Uh, you know, it, it's going back to what I said before. God is, is uh, he knows everything. He knows what's coming for our families. He knows what's coming uh, for our nation, for our city. And if we look to him, he will prepare us. He will be more prepared than any anybody that's, uh, you know, they call them these preppers that are, uh, you know, have these uh, you know, barns and they have all this, this stuff prepped ready for, for a zombie apocalypse, you know, all that stuff. No, God will prepare us for the real thing. For that you know for the things that are truly coming ahead but we have to look to him and then we have to obey him because we can look to him and it it could be revealed but then you know okay well you know sounds crazy lord you know i don't, I don't want to do that but if that's what the lord wants us to do the holy spirit will reveal that to us and we should walk in obedience and so we see that and then then we see that the the ground grade i'm not gonna really focus on it because we only need have a few minutes here I won't speak too long. But here we see that he chose partial obedience. So what happens? As he begins, as he disobeys, then you see this this uh, this downgrade. He, he begins to kind of, first he's separated from the word of God. First thing is that Samuel doesn't speak to him anymore. So he's removed from the word of God. And so in Samuel 15, 35, it says, And, Sam, and Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. So it was... It's a sad situation. So he's separated from the word of God. You know, that happens to us as well. You know, it's one of it's one of the biggest struggles, I think, in my life is to read the Bible every day. You know, you'll never, ever get to the point where it's just, you know, it's routine. It's something every day. It's always a struggle for me. Uh, thankfully, you know, it's been pretty good. And my wife keeps me accountable and, and uh, my family. I'm thankful for that. And, and the people that I minister to, like Ed and, and uh, Jeffrey, they keep me accountable as well. But I try to keep myself accountable with them. But the idea is that it's not an easy thing. And so so first thing that happens is we're separated from the word of God. And 
he is just like Saul was. And then we're also separated from the spirit of God. First Samuel 16, 4, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. That's a sad thing. Now, we're never going to lose the Holy Spirit, but, but I, I know pastor did a whole thing about grieving the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, about, you know, doing things and, and disobeying the Holy Spirit. Basically, that's what happens. We begin to walk in disobedience and we grieve the Spirit. And then, you know, it's just so, so much that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us before he realizes we're not going to listen, that we're not going to obey. So he moves on. You know, he's going to move on to someone until, until we repent. I mean, I mean, it's easy to go back to it, and we're going to talk about that. It's easy to go and repent and ask the Lord to speak to us again, but we have to take those steps of repentance and faith. You know, uh, but David talks about that in Psalm 51, but the New Testament is full of that as well. And so he's, and then he's separated from the people of God. In 1 Samuel 22, 8, <clears throat> Saul starts losing his mind, really, and he, and he assumes that everyone's against him. His son Jonathan is not against him, but he knows that Saul is not right in attacking David. And so what happens is that, you know, John, Jonathan is, is trying to bring them together again. And so, but then he also says, oh, you know, everybody is against him. And he's telling them like, you know, David's not gonna buy you lands. He's not gonna give you lands. He's not gonna give you this. And, and he is basically being isolated. And isolating himself from everyone and everyone is it seems to him at least that everyone is attacking him and this is what happens to us as well you know one of the first things that happens to us is that we're that that uh, we get angry at somebody in church and then we start coming to church we start being around other believers we isolate ourselves we separate ourselves from other, for whatever reason but that's basically the enemy a lot of it is just fiery darts from the enemy because he knows if he can isolate us you know he can make us ineffective if he makes us ineffective, then, you know, he wins. He wins. You're just, you know, a, 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 a soul, a lone soul, you know, uh, thinking everything is against me. And you'll be just like Saul, thinking everybody's against you, where people are just, you know, uh, are just trying to be a help to you, an encouragement to you. And so we see that. <clears throat> so when we, when, uh, so, you know, and, and so even in, in our lives, we can be separated uh, from from other believers sometimes you know it's it's uh you know well it's always it's always wrong to separate because that's what god does god brings us unites us into a family we're built into a family we're brought into a family of believers because you know we're not ourselves we, we belong to christ and christ does what he wants with his body and at least he should do what he wants with his body with his believers with his children uh, you know, Paul always considers, even Peter and the disciples always considered themselves bond slaves of Christ. You know, we don't consider ourselves bond slaves. You know, we'll take God's advice, but we're not his servants. We're not his slaves. But really, that's what we are. And we call him Lord, right? I, I, I think everyone here has accepted Christ as their Savior. It's not just their Savior. It's their Lord and Savior. I know I did. Now, when I did it, I didn't understand the enormity of it, but I think it's something that we definitely need to contemplate. And I think the dying of self really means that he, that we belong to him and our lives are not our own. That's, that's very important. Yeah. <clears throat> and I said, when we accept Jesus as our savior, we receive all that we need to live a life that pleases God. All these resources, as I said, that verse, that he led captivity captive and he gives gifts unto men. When when Jesus is seated, seated on the throne, Peter says that that the fact that you receive the Holy Spirit means that he's up there, means that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit that you receive means that he's he has the power to give it because he's he's God and he's there to send his spirit. So the, the, and so that's that's the proof of his authority, the spirit that we receive. And then the proof of his authority is the body growing, the church. The whole book of Acts is the church growing. It's in, in leaps and bounds and, and people going out. And so Jesus takes residence in our hearts through the gift of his Holy Spirit. It's his Holy Spirit. It's God. If you have, if you, I, I don't want to assume that everyone here has accepted Christ as their Savior. But really, none of this applies to you if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never claimed him as your Lord. If you've never realized that his sacrifice on the cross is the only reason really for for your life, for your salvation. 
and for your eternal life. He's the only one that can give eternal life. All right? He's the he's the uh, Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father. No man comes unto God but by him. You know, and that's that's the truth. If you don't, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I urge you to do that. Please do that. And those people that are maybe hearing on the radio, because these resources that I'm talking about only come through Christ, only come through that salvation. When when Saul receives that new heart, he receives that heart because he realizes that God is bigger than himself and God has called him to be king. Somewhere down the line, he lost that vision, but he had a vision to serve God and to honor God. I do believe that. And, we, and it happens to us as well. I know it's happened to me. You know, we can lose sight of the goal. That's why we're continually admonished. Admonished. I know Paul does. Fight the good fight. Contend for the faith. See whether or not you're in the faith. These things are repeated over and over again. Because we don't want to fool ourselves into thinking that we're saved when we're not. We don't want to fool ourselves into thinking that we're, we're, we're believers if we were not. We don't want to fool ourselves into thinking that we... That we have given our lives to Christ when we when we have it, and so that's that's the urging. And so we are baptized into the community of believers. That's His family, which helps us develop and grow. That's really the the purpose. Uh, there in the Book of Acts, the, the Christians gather together every day and they begin to grow. Imagine these twelve disciples having, you know, three thousand people saved, and how are we going to teach them? They weren't. They were busy every day going to, from house to house teaching these people. Just like Jesus poured his life into them, they realized that that same teaching, he, they began to pour their lives into other people. And that's, that's why the church grew so much. Nowadays, you know, we have so many things going on in our lives that we don't have time to be disciple. We don't have time to disciple others. You know, we have, you know, we have time for everything else. But always for when it comes to the things of the Lord, we have no time for that. And so, but we're baptized into that community. That potential is there. Um, and then we have the word of God, the scriptures that gives us wisdom to develop the mind of Christ. That's the sad part about the, Christ, the Christianity in our Western society is that most people don't study or read the Bible enough to develop that mind of Christ. We don't do it, myself included. You know, that's what God is trying to develop in us. It doesn't just come by, by osmosis or by proxy. De to develop the mind of Christ, you have to be in the word of God. And you have to be, be depending upon the Holy Spirit to teach you and instruct you. Again, we have every resource that we need. And these are just three. I focus on these three specifically, but there's so much more that the Holy Spirit that God has for us to be able to, to have victory. Jesus says that, that the gates of hell won't stand against us. Most of the time we're running. We're running from the devil. And so how do you get back on track? And you ask God to forgive you for your disobedience, plain and simple. I have to do that every day, to tell you the truth. There's times, but God does forgive. You ask him to forgive you, and then you begin to walk in obedience. Believe that God has a plan and trust him. That's, that's, that's the thing. Believe that he has a plan for you. He does. He has a plan for all of us. Our sanctification, if anything, that, that, that's the main plan. It's our sanctification. And then trust him, right? Uh, trust and obey. That's the name of this message. And then obey, obey that plan as is revealed in his word. The plan doesn't just come, again, by osmosis. You have to get in the word of God. You have to learn to, to hear the voice of God and the Holy Spirit. That, that takes diligence. That takes study. That takes meditation. That takes silence. That's the hardest thing in our Western society today is silence. Meditation and silence, because I, I could be on my phone from the 5 a.m. in the morning till I hit hit the bed and, and and everything in between with text messages, YouTube and all these other things. And that Satan has purposely done that so that we will be distracted. And, and there's times that, you know, we can be on our phones or we can be on television, watch movies, whatever it is, and not once be in the word of God and be entertained all day and distracted and it's all it is is distraction and so obey that plan as it's revealed in the in the in his word and then take full advantage of the resources available to us from god we have incredible resources the bible continues to 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 show reveal those to us i just named three specific ones but there's so many so many more 
and, and now. Uh, but uh, just to reiterate those three specific ones, we have the word of God, we have the spirit of God, and we have the body of Christ. Those are the, the main ones that I'm uh, emphasizing here today. But there's so many, so many more because God wants us to succeed. He does. But without without obedience, there is no su uh, success without hearing God's voice and seeking his face. There's no success It's only defeat. As Satan will divide us, he will separate us from from each other. He will separate us from the Holy Spirit, and then he will, and then he will, um, he will, he will get us uh, to not read the Word of God. Those are the three main things we're saying. Those are the basics of the Christian life, and those usually are the ones that we falter in. Uh, 